background of this scripture is that uh, Moses had been up on top of the mountain in the cloud of God's presence. And while Moses was on top of the mountain for more than 40 days, God wrote with his own finger on tablets of stone. And while Moses was up in that glory cloud, God spoke to him and said, Moses, there's a problem. Something's going on down below at the bottom of the mountain. And of course, Moses came down and found the children of Israel. They had made a, an idol, a golden calf. They were worshiping it. And uh, Moses got angry, broke the tablets. And in the aftermath of that whole scene, in Exodus chapter 33, God speaks to Moses and he says, Moses, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pack up the children of Israel and I want you to lead them to the promised land. I'm going to keep every promise that I made to you. I'm going to drive out all of your enemies. I'm going to give you peace and security. I'm going to make you fat and happy in the land, flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to do everything I said I was going to do for you, but, God says, I'm not going to go with you myself. I'm going to send an angel with you, and I'm going to go find myself a new people. And so in response to God's announcement to Moses, Moses begins to pray. And that's where we pick up the story in Exodus 33 and beginning in verse 7. It says, Now Moses was in the habit of taking a tent and pitching it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent outside the camp. And whenever Moses went to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances of their tents, watching Moses until he went in. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke to Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they all stood and worshipped each at the entrance of his tent, and the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but Joshua, the son of Nun, did not. Look at verse 12. Moses said to the Lord, You've been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you'll send with me. You've said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you really are pleased with me, teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence doesn't go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you're pleased with me and your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish us from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you've asked because I'm pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. There was a group of women that met for prayer every week, four of them. And one morning they decided that they were going to put into practice the command in the book of James to confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. The leader of the little prayer group was brave. She offered to go first. She said, I have to confess to you, sisters, that I have a real problem with materialism. I'm constantly shopping. I always want new clothes, new shoes, new purses. I always want new things for the house. She said, I always want more. I really need you to pray for me. The next woman was embarrassed. She said, it's hard for me to tell you that I really struggle with bitterness. I remember every unkind word that everyone has said to me. I keep replaying them over and over again in my mind. I, I can't let go of things. I need you to pray for me. The next woman said, I have to tell you, I have a problem with overeating. Every Monday morning, I start a new diet, and by Monday afternoon, it's over. She said, I eat in secret. I hide food around the house. She said, I need you to pray for me. The fourth woman sat there fidgeting very nervously when everybody looked at her. And after a minute, finally, she blurted out, Okay, I really need you to pray for me because my sin is gossip, and I'm dying to get out of here right now. How often do you pray for our church? How often do you pray for one another? How often do you pray for God's strength for one another? 
for God's divine health for one another, for God's provision, for his protection. How often do you pray for one another that you'll know Jesus to the full extent that anyone can ever know him? I want to tell you, our staff, our pastoral staff, meets every Tuesday morning, and we start out our work week by praying for you, sometimes for an hour, sometimes for an hour and a half, sometimes for two hours or more, and these are the things that we pray over you. We pray for you by name. We pray for you corporately, and I want to tell you, when we're done praying on Tuesday morning, you have been prayed for. But how often do you pray for the unity of our church? How often do you pray for the strength of our church, for the effectiveness of our church? How often do you pray for your leaders, our board of deacons and trustees, our ministry leaders? How often do you pray for your pastor? Oh, I know you pray every Sunday on your way in. Please, Lord, this week, let him be divine, but not eternal. I'm so thankful for the handful of people who I know pray for me. One of them is Sandy Chicatelli, our little prayer warrior. She turned 90 this summer, and every time she sees me, she says, Pastor, I'm praying for you, and she tells me exactly what she prays for me, and I want to tell you I feel her prayers. Right now we're talking about praying great prayers. What are great prayers? For one thing, great prayers are big Great prayers extend beyond the scope of our little lives. They extend beyond the scope of our personal wishes and wants, and they reach out and make a difference in the lives of others. Great prayers are intercessory. That's a, a big way of saying that we pray on behalf of someone else. Great prayers are biblical. They're informed by the truth of this book. They're conformed to the faith of this book. They're directed to the God of this holy book. Great prayers are benevolent. They move the heart of God because they reflect the heart of God. They're full of compassion, mercy, forgiveness. They entreat God to change his mind about people and situations. Great prayers are beneficial. They move the hand of God. They move God. They compel him to act, to intervene, to interrupt. They compel God to dispatch holy angels to come to the aid of his children and his children's children. Great prayers touch heaven and they make a difference on earth. We're looking at some of the great prayers of the Bible together. Last week, we talked about Abraham's prayer for Sodom, which, by the way, is the first intercessory prayer in the Bible. The rain interrupted us on Sunday morning, and you didn't get to hear the end of my sermon. If you want to hear the best part, uh, you can go to the website at hcchurch.com, and you can listen to the file from last Saturday night. But Moses' intercessory prayer here in Exodus 33 is my favorite prayer in the entire Bible. If you've been around for a while, you've heard me speak about it. If you've been to one of our membership classes, you've heard me talk about this prayer. God will either change people or he'll change people. But I want to talk about it from a little different angle today. As I look at Moses' prayer for Israel, I see three keys to praying great prayers for our church. And I want to share them with you quickly this morning. Three keys for praying great prayers for our church. The first key is this. Pray with the habits of an intercessor. Pray with the habits of an intercessor. One of the things that we learn from Exodus 32 and 33 is that God's family on earth only survives through prayer. God's family only advances through prayer. It only stays on course through prayer. It only thrives and succeeds through prayer. How many of you want to be part of a strong church? How many of you want to be part of a church that is spiritually alive? that's bearing spiritual fruit. How many of you want to be part of a church that is an environment in which we can raise our kids to love Jesus, to, to know God, that we can leave to them? See, I'm looking forward. You know, I want to build faith too because I'm looking forward to putting it into the hands of the next generation and seeing them go further for Jesus than we ever could in our time. 
And the key to all of that, if you want a strong church here, if you want a thriving, healthy, spiritually alive church, the key to all of that is intercession. Looking at Moses, I see some habits of intercessors. First of all, I see that intercessors have a regular place for prayer. Intercessors have a regular place for private prayer. Before the tabernacle in the wilderness was ever constructed, we learn that Moses had his own pup tent of prayer. It says that his habit was to take a tent and to go far outside of the camp and pitch it and to get in it and pray. Moses had a dedicated place of prayer away from all the distractions of the camp, away from all the noise of the camp, uh, away from all of the prying eyes and, and big ears. He had a place that he could go and pour his heart out to God in prayer and also listen for the heartbeat of God. I wonder, where do you pray? Where is your pup tent of prayer? Where is your prayer closet? Where do you go to regularly pour your heart out to God? Is it in a spare room in your house? We don't have any spare rooms, but maybe you do. Is it in a, a chair in a quiet corner? Is it beside your bed or, or maybe down in the basement? Is it at your kitchen table after everyone has gone for the day? Is it on your morning walk or maybe it's even in your car? You know, we have several men here at Harvest Time who have shared with me that they leave for work early and they have places along the road on the way to work where they pull off for a little while and maybe for 15 or 20 minutes they just spend some time in prayer pouring their heart out to God before they start their day. I have to confess to you that I got busted this week. For the last few months, there has been this beat-up old minivan that keeps parking in the mouth of our driveway uh, every couple of days. It's half held together by duct tape. And there is a, an equally beat-up looking man who sits inside the van, sometimes for an hour, sometimes for more. And it irritates me because there's lots of traffic coming in and out of the driveway all through the day uh, and he's sitting there kind of blocking the way so I was leaving for an appointment the other morning and I had to pull around him to get out of the driveway and just then farmer John from next door came by in his golf cart so I put down my window and I I said hello to, to farmer John and I asked him I said is there anything you need and he said oh no he said I'm just coming to say hi to my friend John here in the van and I said to him yeah I said what's he doing here anyway and Farmer John said, oh, he comes here to pray. He loves it here. I was busted. <laughs> here I was annoyed by this duct tape van blocking my driveway. This is Greenwich after all. And I didn't know that that was someone's prayer pup tent. Would to God that this entire parking lot would be covered every day with people in pup tents of prayer. If I were to ask you, where do you pray? Could you tell me instantly? If you can, it means you might not have your own pup tent of prayer. And if you don't have one, it's time right now to figure out where you're going to set one up. You need to put a little effort into designing a place where you can go regularly to pour your heart out to God. Moses was over 80 years of age in this passage, and here he is schlepping a tent far outside of the camp and setting it up so he could pray. So surely you and I could take a few minutes today to figure out where it is that we're going to go pray and pour our heart out to God. Intercessors have a designated place for private prayer. Another thing I find is that intercessors pray frequently. The secret to Moses' success as a leader, the secret to the survival of God's family in the wilderness was that Moses never stopped praying. When the children of Israel fell into sin with the golden calf, Moses started praying while he was still on top of the mountain. He prayed when he got to the bottom of the mountain. He prayed in his pup tent. He prayed again when he was in the cleft of the rock, covered over with God's hand while his glory passed by. Intercessors pray. They pray and pray, and then they pray some more. 
They pray while they're surrounded by the glory of God. They pray in the moments when they're disappointed and hurt with God's family. They pray in their pup tents. They pray in the morning. They pray in the midday. They pray in the evening. When do you pray? What times of the day have you set aside for prayer? Can you tell me right off the cuff? You need to pray. I need your prayers. Our leaders need your prayers. Our congregation needs your prayers. Pray with the habits of an intercessor. Another habit I find is that intercessors pray often with other intercessors. Beloved, listen, people who love prayer are drawn to others who love prayer. It says in Exodus 33, when Moses went out to his pup tent to pray, all those who wanted to seek the Lord went out there and joined him. What a time we had on Friday evening, fire in the night, worshiping and praying from 6 Friday evening to 6 in the morning, Saturday morning. Pastor Ruth, I want to just stand up here and say thank you to you for doing such an amazing job putting together fire in the night. I, I want to thank all the worship teams. We had worship teams here. It was fun every two hours from six in the evening. And for everyone who came and worshiped, thank you. For everyone who came to pray, I want to tell you, it was the whole night was amazing. But from 9 p.m. to 10 p.m., it was absolute glory in this place. There were flags waving, there were people dancing, there were people bowing before the Lord, there were people lying on the floor, there were tongues, there were prophecies, there were powerful prayers, and I have to tell you, that is where I want to be. That's the atmosphere that I want to live in. I, 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 when I'm, I'm here in, in those moments, I feel like the disciples on the top of the Mount of Transfiguration, let's just set up a pup tent right here and never leave this place. Those are the people that I I love to be with the people I love to be around. So I look at Moses' encounter with God in his pup tent. I find three results of good prayer habits. First of all, when you're in the habit of intercession, God will meet you there every time. When you're in the habit of prayer, God will show up. It says, whenever Moses went to his pup tent, the cloud of God's presence came down to meet him. And listen, when you're in the habit of praying, God will show up every time for you too. You won't have to wonder whether God is there. You will know that he's there. You'll not have to wonder whether God is listening. You will know that you have been heard and that your answer is on the way. When you're in the habit of intercession, God will give you clear direction for the present. It says that while Moses was in his pup tent, God came and spoke to him face to face. Numbers chapter 12 verse 8 sheds more light on that. It says that God spoke to Moses mouth to mouth. What that means is that God spoke directly to Moses and Moses heard God clearly. He heard the voice of God plainly, and he knew what to do. Beloved, listen, when you are in the habit of intercession, you will understand God clearly too. Some people have a, a very mystical concept of God's voice, as if God only speaks to his people in riddles. Beloved, listen, God does not speak to be confusing. God speaks to be understood. He is the revealer of mysteries. And the more that you pray, the more easily you'll understand his voice and receive direction. How many of you need some direction from God right now in your life? You need an answer. You have a decision in front of you. You need to hear God. You need him to direct your footsteps. I want to tell you, if you need direction, get in your prayer pup tent and God will meet you and God will give you direction. As far as harvest time goes, I want to tell you, I know exactly what we're supposed to be doing right now. I know exactly what we're supposed to be doing this fall. I know exactly what we're supposed to do for our 30th anniversary in December because I have heard from the Lord. And if you need direction for the present, God will meet you in your place of prayer and he'll help you. When you're in the habit of intercession, God will give you a picture of the bright future that he's prepared for you. While Moses was in his pup tent, God showed him a picture of the future. 
Moses saw the children of Israel in the promised land. He saw them with all their enemies driven far away. He saw them living in peace. He saw them living in protection. He saw the children of Israel living in the blessings of God. Moses also in that pup tent saw thousands of years down the road. He saw a prophet coming, a second Moses, the mediator of a new covenant, the man, Jesus Christ. God showed him what was to come. And listen, in your pup tent, God will show you a picture of your future too. God will show you laying a hold of your destiny in Christ. He'll show you overcoming your enemies. He'll show you living in the fullness and the blessing of the Lord. I know what's going to happen next year at harvest time because the Lord showed me in a dream a couple of weeks ago. I know what's going to happen, the good things that are going to happen to some of you because God has already shown me. Three keys for praying great prayers for our church. Pray with the habits of an intercessor. Secondly, pray with the heart of an intercessor. Pray with the heart of an intercessor. There are three heart qualities that I see in these chapters. The first one is this, intercessors have a supernatural love for God's family. Intercessors have a supernatural love for God's family. When Moses came down from the mountain, he began to intercede for the people. And he told God, God, take my soul in exchange for theirs. Blot my name out of your book of life if you will only forgive them. Beloved, I want to tell you that is an astounding prayer. Moses is saying, God, I am willing to spend eternity in hell if you will only save your people. Unbelievably, Paul prayed the same thing for the Jewish people in Romans 9. He said, I wish I could be accursed. I wish I could be cut off from Christ if only Israel could be saved. I have to be perfectly honest with you this morning. I am not there. I am willing to go through hell for you, and we have, but I am not willing to go to hell for you. And thankfully, I don't have to. God told Moses, Moses, what you're asking is not possible. There was only one man who could offer his life in exchange for the salvation of the lost souls of the world. And that was the man, Jesus Christ. But listen to me. Moses and Paul were filled with that same love that compelled Jesus to lay down his life. And that's why they prayed what they did. They were filled with a supernatural kind of love. They were filled with a love that comes from above. And that's the heart of an intercessor. We don't possess enough love in our own strength for God's family. But Paul said God pours his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us intercessors love with an extraordinary supernatural God kind of a love another heart quality of an intercessor intercessors choose solidarity with God's family over self-promotion intercessors choose solidarity with God's family over self-promotion God tested Moses in Exodus 32. After the people sinned, God said to Moses, move out of my way so that I can destroy these people. And he said, Moses, I will make of you a great nation. God said, I'm going to start all over again, Moses, and I'm going to start with you. This was Moses' chance for glory. This was his chance to go down in history. If Moses had God if Moses had taken God up on that offer, we might be speaking about the country of Moses in the Middle East and not the country of Israel. We might be speaking about the Mosites and not the Israelites. Of course, Moses did go down in history precisely because he passed the test. If he hadn't passed the test, he would have gone down with history. But Moses chose solidarity 
with God's family over self-promotion. He was committed to seeing God's family succeed. He was committed to seeing what God had started all the way through to a glorious finish. Moses reminded God, God, you started this. Now you have to finish it because you promised that you would. Beloved, listen to me. He who began a good work in you, he will see it all the way through to completion. He who who began a good work at Harvest Time Church in 1983. He who began a good work on this campus in 1999. He who began a good work when we moved into this building in 2004. He's going to bring it all the way through to completion and I'm not going anywhere until I see God bring the fulfillment of the promises that he's made for us. Moses was all in as an intercessor, and we need more of that today. Too many people that have spiritual gifts have become spiritually puffed up. They're too independent. They're lone rangers. They operate outside of the covering of the body of Christ. They operate outside of the authority of the local body of believers. They talk about my ministry. Can I tell you, Moses never talked about his ministry. All he talked about was God's family. Jesus never talked about his ministry. All he talked about was God's flock. All I have to say about your ministry is your call is not your call. It's God's call on you. The heart of an intercessor, a third quality I find, is that intercessors take ownership of God's people without taking possession of them. They take ownership for God's people without taking possession of them. There is a volley between God and Moses in these two chapters, and it's almost humorous. While Moses is still on top of the mountain, in the glory cloud, God says, Moses, there's a problem downstairs. Beloved, can I tell you, even in the midst of the glory cloud, there are still people problems. Even when God is visiting, messes happen. There can be revival happening on the top of the mountain, and there can be backsliding going on at the bottom of the mountain. And I love what God says to Moses. He says, Moses, your people who you brought out of Egypt have made an idol. And Moses says to God, hey, they're not my people, they're your people. And for two chapters, it's up for grabs whose people these really are. But Moses takes ownership for God's family. He identifies with their sin in repentance. He takes it upon himself to repent for the sins that they committed. That's what intercessors do. They take it upon themselves to say, we're sorry, God, for the sins of your church, for the sins of your family. We're sorry, God, for the sins of our nation. God, would you forgive us? I wonder, have you taken ownership of our church? Have you married our church? Some of you, you might be visiting here for the first time today. We welcome you. We're glad to see you. Congratulations. If this is your first day, you have 100% attendance record. Better than any of us. But for those of you who call Harvest Time home, have you taken ownership? It bothers me so much when people say, oh, Pastor Glenn, your church is beautiful or your church is great. It's not my church. It's his church. It is our church. <laughs> Moses interceded for God's family. He literally stood in the way so that God could not pour out his judgment on the people. Do you really understand the power of an intercessor? We get in the way, we stand in the way, and God cannot move in judgment. He cannot act in judgment against anyone while we're standing in the way. 
As long as, as the members of Abraham's family were in the city of Sodom, the angels said, we can't destroy it. When they were leading Lot and his daughters out of the city, they said, hurry now because we can't do anything. We can't touch this city while you're still standing in the way. God said to Moses, get out of my way, Moses, so that I can go get him. And Moses stood between God and the people and he blocked the way and he said, no, God, you will not. Can I tell you something, beloved? God has invested us with that kind of authority on the earth as his own people to stand in the way between God and our lost family members and say, no, God, you will not. God has given us that authority, stand in the way between God and America and say, no, God, you will not. We beg you, we implore you, God, have mercy on our country. Moses took ownership for God's people, but he refused to take possession. He refused to try to control things in his own strength. He didn't force his own will. He didn't try to force his own agenda. He didn't lead God's people in his own human wisdom. Can I tell you something about Moses? The Bible says that Moses in Egypt, before he came back to God, it says Moses was a man mighty in word and deed. History records that he was the commander of all the armies of Pharaoh before he killed that Egyptian and fled into the wilderness and found God. He was a capable person, but Moses did not lead God's people in the wisdom of his own earthly intelligence. He led the people by seeking God. These aren't my people, God. They're your people. Looking at the conversation in the pup tent, I find three responses that God has to an intercessor's heart. First of all, an intercessor's heart pleases God. That kind of heart brings God's pleasure. God said to Moses, I'm pleased with you, Moses, because you passed the test. And pleasing God is a good thing because it triggers the second response, which is answered prayer. God said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you ask because I'm pleased with you. And finally, intercessors, the heart of an intercessor, brings God's response of mercy and grace on God's family. On the way to school this last week, I was explaining to my kids the difference between mercy and grace. It comes in handy every once in a while to have a, a pastor as a dad. And I told my kids, mercy is not getting what we do deserve, and grace is getting the good things that we don't deserve. Do you know that's exactly what Moses prayed for and exactly what God's family received. Moses prayed, God, forgive them. Don't give them what they deserve. And then Moses prayed, God, give them every good thing that you've given me. The experience that I have had in this pup tent, in your presence, I want all of them to have. All the goodness of the Lord that I've experienced, I want every one of them to experience. Do you know that was a prayer that God answered? But I wonder, do you pray for our church that God would have mercy? Do you pray that God would spare us from what we really deserve when we've made a mistake, when we've gone the wrong direction? Do you pray that God will give us every good thing that he has in store for us? Three keys for praying great prayers for our church. Pray with the habits of an intercessor. Pray with the heart of an intercessor. And finally, pray through until you reap the harvest of an intercessor. I'm going to ask the worship team to come help me. Pray through until you reap the harvest of an intercessor. You doing all right this morning? Can I get you anything? A little lemonade, a little iced tea? Any, any, I'm going to do it one day. I'm going to have people come in. I'm going to ask you that, and then I'm going to set it up. I'm going to have people come in. All right, everybody look at me. Moses' prayer in these two chapters is a wrestling match with God over the issue of God's presence. Moses kept pressing God and pressing God and pressing God until the children of Israel received a manifestation of God's presence unlike anything that anyone else in the Old Testament ever experienced. The harvest of an intercessor is 
God's presence manifest in three dimensions. First of all, pray through for God's distinguishing presence. Moses said, God, if your presence, the presence of God was with Moses personally, but Moses said, God, if your presence doesn't go with us, we're not taking one more step. We're not budging. We refuse to move. We refuse to do anything unless your presence goes with us. What else will distinguish us from everyone else out there? Beloved, can I tell you why I love this church? I love this church because the first time Denise and I ever walked into it in June of 1996 in the Western Greenwich Civic Center, we felt God's presence here. And we have felt God's presence here every day since then. We live just down the road in a little house owned by the church. We drive past the front of this building a hundred times a week. And every time I drive by, I have to look in and my heart skips a beat because I feel God's presence here. I feel his presence in the parking lot. I feel his presence on the front lawn. I feel his presence in the foyer. I feel his presence in the sanctuary. I feel his presence in the coffee bar downstairs, in the classrooms. I feel his presence in the prayer room at the far end of this building. I feel his presence in my office. When we worship, I feel his presence. When I'm teaching the word, I feel his presence. When we pray, I feel his presence. When we're fellowshipping, I feel his presence. When we serve, I feel his presence. That's what distinguishes us. That's what makes us us everywhere. I feel his presence. The harvest of an intercessor, it's God's distinguishing presence. Secondly, pray through for God's transforming presence. Everybody look at me. God's presence changes us. After Moses met with God in the pup tent, the Bible said that his face was transformed. He would come out of that tent, and it says in Hebrew that rays of light beamed from his face. They translated that wrong in Latin. They used the word horns. And that's why sometimes you might see pictures of Moses or statues of Moses and he has horns on his head. It's because they mistranslated the Hebrew word rays, rays of light beamed from the face of Moses. Only they didn't last. So Moses put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from staring at him while the glory of God faded away from his face. In Exodus 33, 18, when Moses prayed, now God, show me your glory. What he was asking to see was the full expression of God's presence so that it would create a permanent transformation in him. You see, to see God as he really is, is to be permanently transformed. John says, it does not yet appear what we shall become, but when we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. <laughs> Moses knew that no man could see God and live, but he didn't care. He so longed for a permanent transformation in his character. He so longed for a permanent transformation in his inner being that he said, God, even if it kills me, I want to see you in a manifestation of your glory that will leave me changed forever. That was a request that pleased God's heart, but he couldn't answer it. He said, no, Moses, it's not possible. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do for you. I'll put you in a cleft of a rock, in a little cave. I'll cover you there with my hand while I pass by. And you can see just the after parts of my glory, but you can't see it. The thing that you're asking for, you're denied. But Paul writes in the New Testament, 
And he says that we, being recipients of a new covenant in the blood of Jesus, that we have access to that very thing that Moses was denied. He was the mediator of a covenant of fading glory, but we are the recipients of a new covenant of ever-increasing glory that comes from the Lord. The thing that was impossible for Moses is now possible for us because of the blood of Jesus. It is possible for us to encounter God's presence again and again and again and not for that experience to fade away, but for it to grow and grow. Do you know why I love nights like Friday night? Do you know why I love nights while the glory of God is here and flags are waving and people are doing weird things? Some of you don't get it. I know you don't get it. But listen, the reason I love to be in that atmosphere is because God is changing me in those moments and it's a change that sticks and never goes away. The harvest of an intercessor. It's God's distinguishing presence, God's transforming presence. And finally this, I'm over time, but it's my birthday, so I'm going to take five more minutes. (laughs) Pray through for God's presence abiding in the center. Listen, listen, listen. Everybody catch this, please. This is so cool. If you think about this long enough, you'll speak in tongues. I want you to see the result of Moses' prayer of intercession. I want you to notice with me, when Moses went to pray, it says he went far outside of the camp and he pitched his tent and God met him there. The presence of God was near his people, but the presence of God was not in the center of his people. In fact, it had been that way from the moment they left Egypt. When they ran from Pharaoh's army and they ran into the Red Sea, God's presence was behind them in a pillar of fire and cloud. When they ventured into the wilderness, God's presence was ahead of them in a pillar of fire and cloud. When they got to Mount Sinai, God's presence was hovering high above them in a glory cloud and no one could come near except Moses. In the pup tent of prayer, God's presence was near, but he was beside his people. And this is what Moses prayed for. He said, God, I am praying for the same presence that I have experienced out here in this pup tent to be right in the center of your people, to be right in the center of their daily lives to be right in the center of their families, to be right in the center of their friendships, to be right in the center of this nation. And listen to me, because Moses had the habits of an intercessor, because he had the heart of an intercessor, God's family reaped the harvest of an intercessor. And God said to Moses, you know what, Moses, I have an idea. Let's build a bigger tent. Let's build a tent that's big enough for this whole nation to come. And I'll tell you what, rather than putting the tent outside on the far edge of the camp, why don't we put the tent right in the middle so that I can abide in the midst of my people. They will be my people and I will be their God in the center of their lives. And for 40 years, God stood in the center of the camp of Israel, in a pillar of fire and cloud, a manifestation of his presence like no one else in the Old Testament ever saw. Because Moses prayed. Everybody look at me. Imagine what would happen if we all began praying great prayers for our church. You know what I dream about? I dream about a church that turns New York City upside down for the glory of God. I dream about a church that turns Westchester County and Fairfield County upside down for the glory of God. I dream about a church where people can't stay away because the goodness of God is here in such a palpable way. How do we get there? It's through the habits of the heart of an intercessor. Imagine what would happen if we all prayed every day in our pup tent, God would come and he would stay right here in the middle. Would you stand on your feet this morning and would you give Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, a great big praise in this place. Oh, come on, let's give Jesus a great big praise.
Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Come on, lift up your voice. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, somebody, give glory to Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Lord, we love you. Come on, let's just begin to express your love for Jesus. We love you, Lord. 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 Come on, somebody shout unto God with a voice of triumph in this place this morning. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Come on, sing Jesus, be the center of my life. Jesus, be the center of my life. And Jesus, be the center of my life. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus. Sing that again. Jesus, be the center of my life, everybody. Jesus, be the center of my life. Jesus, be the center of my life. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus, be the center of your church. Oh, Jesus, be the center of your church. Jesus, be the center of your church. And every knee will bow, and every tongue shall profess you, Jesus. Jesus. Sing, Jesus, be the center of our church. Jesus, be the center of our church. Oh, Jesus, be the center of our church. Every knee in Westchester County, every knee in Fairfield County, every knee in Greenwich, you, Jesus, Jesus, sing Jesus, oh Jesus. say that lovely name of Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Lift up your hands, lift up your faces to heaven right now, if you would. Our time is really past. I want to ask you this this morning, and listen, there is no guilt, there's no condemnation, but I want to ask you, where do you pray? Where is your pup tent of prayer? Is it in your car? Is it in a chair? Is it, where is your pup tent of prayer? And without any condemnation, I want to say to you this morning, if you don't have one, it's time for you to set one up. It's time for you to figure out where you're going to pray every day, where you're going to pour out your heart to God. You don't have to be frustrated not knowing which way to turn, what to do. I promise you, if you'll make a pup tent of prayer, God will show up and meet you there every time. I promise you he'll tell you what to do today. I promise you he'll give you a beautiful picture of the future that he's prepared for you. Father, right now in Jesus' name, would you take your hands and put them on your ears real quickly? It's just symbolic, real fast. We're so late, but we're going to do it. Father, right now in Jesus' name, I pray for an upgrade in listening, Lord. I pray, God, for an upgrade in our prayer life. Father, I pray that you'd increase this morning. Lord, even with the ministry of your word, let grace be dispensed with it. That increases our capacity for hearing your voice, Lord. Father, I pray that we would hear you clearly, that you would speak. Speak to us mouth to mouth, God. Father, that we would hear in the whispers of our heart through your word. Lord, speaking through messengers. God, I pray for a release of dreams and visions over your people, Lord. God, in the night hours, I pray that you'd heap revelation upon us. Father, I pray that you'd send angelic messengers, Lord. God, I pray that you'd help us to know what to do. I feel like some of you need to have 
big decisions to make. And by Tuesday or Wednesday of this week, you are going to know what to do. God is going to speak clearly and directly, not in a riddle or in a mystery. God's going to speak plainly to you, and you're going to know that you know in your heart what is the right decision. Take your hand and put it over your heart real quick. Come on, I want you to just ask him, more love, more love, more love, more love. Father, give us the heart of an intercessor. God, fill our hearts to overflowing with supernatural love for your family. We can't love enough in our strength. We can't love deeply enough. We can't love consistently enough, patiently enough in our own strength. But God, I come on, you ask him right now for more love. Paul said he pours his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Ask him, fill me up, Lord, fill me up. You need to fill up because you leak. You need to be filled up with more love for the family of God. Father, give us the heart of intercession. And Father, right now in Jesus' name, take the hand of someone next to you. Father, right now in Jesus' name, I pray that we would receive the harvest of an intercessor. God, your distinguishing, your transforming presence, abiding right in the center. God, let your center, let your presence abide right in the center of our entire lives, in the center of our marriages. Let your presence abide in the center of our relationship with our children, in the center of our homes. Holy Spirit, I thank you right now for sending a wind through our homes while we're here praying. Thank you for sending a wind through our homes that changes the atmosphere, that cleanses the spiritual environment of our houses. Lord, the sound of joyful shouting and salvation shall be in the tents of the righteous of the Lord. No more arguing, no more contention, no more sarcasm, no more ugliness, no more cutting remarks. Father, I thank you for coming to abide in the center of our homes right now. God, in the center of our friendships, our finances, our work, our health, Jesus in the center. Now, God, as we go our own way, I pray that the cloud of your presence would envelop us. Let your protection surround us. Let your provision accompany us. Let your providence lead us and your peace encircle us until we come together again. And everyone said, amen and amen. God bless you, everyone. Have a great day in Jesus. Hug about five people and have a great, it's going to be a good week. I want to tell you, God's with you this week. Be blessed in the Lord.